Hello everyone, welcome back to Camnet Studio. Now, a lot of time, months have passed since our last video. Sorry about that. It's difficult, we have a lot of stuff going on. Uh, if you take a look at our site, you would, I think, notice that we have been doing conferences, lectures, projects, excavations. It's, it, there's a lot to do. So it's difficult to dedicate our time to these videos, but when we can, we are happy. And today, in fact, we want to answer a question that came through our email, ask at camnus.org, and we invite you all to submit your questions. And if they're interesting, if they're noteworthy, we would like to answer them here on camera. Like the one that came through from the Philippines, from Eric Robles. Thank you, Eric, for your question. Uh, he, answer, he asks us, is it possible to use folklore to inform and infer on archaeological findings and help to understand the past? If it's possible, what are the critiques towards this approach? Are there such cases in the past or present that folklore led to archaeological findings? This is a very interesting question. Obviously, it would take a very long time to go in all the different aspects. I will try just to give you, a, a, let's say, a framework of the situation, of this concept and how actually it uh, interacts with archaeology. And we're going to go this through five main points. Let's start. Now, before starting, I think it's important to underline how folklore within the archaeological field, within the archaeological research, is actually a field of studies. It is present, especially some countries, some universities, some departments, some schools of thought have this branch of studies. So it's very interesting, actually. And it reaches out to different aspects we could say concerning anthropology in general, uh, which draws from ritual, religion, semiotics, the, the various uh, meanings of symbols and how we read those, uh, anything connected to this, and especially going in the direction of oral tradition and beliefs. That is the definition of folk lore. Folk is the people, and lore is the account of it, produced by it. So we're going to say, as I said, we're going to take a look at five main points to try to understand better this interaction. So let's start immediately. Point number one, the answer, the short answer. Absolutely yes, there is this interaction. There is this uh, aid of folklore within archaeological research, absolutely. But as we will see, we have to pay attention. We have to be careful. We have to know what we're doing and how to use it. In any case, clearly we are drawing also, as I said, anthropology, but also ethno-archaeology. That is also something very important, which not only clearly folklore relies on, where we observe certain behaviors, certain customs, traditions in current or, let's say, modern history or contemporary history, meaning just a few decades ago, populations and how they relate to their environment and observing their traditions, once again, how they do things, actually, their style, their beliefs in general. So that's something very important where folklore clearly comes in, creeps in, and also a branch of studies called archaeomythology which is strictly connected to Maria Gimbutas, who is a controversial figure, actually. Uh, but there is, uh, I mean, her studies uh, dedicated to the mother goddess and uh, a, a lot of prehistoric uh, monuments does have value. And she created this, uh, this branch, this, we could say, field of studies, which goes and draws and brings together Folklore, absolutely, but also historical linguistics, comparative religion, uh, mythology, ethnology, as we were seeing, archaeology, clearly, all mixed together. 
And sometimes interesting things do come out of that, together with, in her case, prehistoric data. But we must pay attention because folklore, this is a very important point, it works better with, we could say, the history, the traditions coming from the medieval all the way up to recent times. Because if we go too back, there isn't the memory of certain things. There is no folklore of the ancient times. Unless there is some, some aspects such tied, such strongly tied, rooted in a specific population, community, tradition, that is carried on centuries and millennia. But that is very rare. When we encounter lore, it, it really, it usually uh, starts within late antiquity if we're, if we're lucky, but usually the medieval times. Also because we have more historical records at a certain point uh, from that period onwards. Not the first centuries, but after a while, all the way to the 16th, 17th, 18th century, early 19th century, early, 20, early 19th, 20th century, and so on. That is where folklore is merely concentrated, I would say. Let's proceed. Okay, our second point is focused on the risks of using this, the pitfalls, okay? This is very important for those of you who want to use somehow consider folklore in their research process. We, we have more or less four case scenarios adopting this and what is the risk. So the first one is that we must consider folklore as something not true, not reliable. It must be the starting point, okay? We consider it, but we must be critical towards it. We can't just accept it as something true, clearly. But it's good to say this. <laughs> you never know. So there must be, there, there could be a connection with reality, with what happened, but we must start, the starting point must be uh, almost as a negative uh, approach, uh, meaning that it, it is not considered true. It has to be proven to be true. A second consideration is that there may, may be something true in what we're collecting, listening, hearing, gathering, understanding, but maybe it changed through time, okay? There's also this consideration we always have to take into consideration that things that are specific um, information changed gradually through time. Another consideration we have to do is that a specific information, let's call it like that, a folklore of a specific subject may be valid, may be true in a specific context. But if you move in a different context, maybe a similar context, maybe a, a, a closely related context, but it might be completely different. It might be not valid in that other context, okay? This is also something that we must take in, into consideration. If it's true somewhere, it doesn't mean it's also true somewhere else, even if it's very similar, if not identical. One last consideration, even though we could do many more, is that something that related to folklore may appear as valid, as true, but maybe it's not so ancient as it appears to be. Maybe it was something introduced very recently, like in the 18 or 1900s. So we always have to bear in mind all these little parts parts and processes in our mind to uh, approach this very risky, I wanna say this, I wanna highlight this very risky approach. Let's proceed. Okay, our third point is dedicated to an example I would like to introduce into an or in order to better understand what may happen. It's not perfectly connected to folklore, but it's something very similar. What am I talking about? The example of the cypress tree, which I do sometimes. Now, you must know that, at least mainly in Italy, in other places around the Mediterranean, graveyards have cypress trees around them. And this comes, it's a very strong tradition that comes from the Phoenicians. They probably brought it from abroad, from the Near East, which then uh, passed through the Greeks 
the Romans, and it was just established uh, throughout Italy, France, uh, the Mediterranean, we could say in general, not everywhere now, but it, it is a strong tradition in this sense. Now, if you look online, for example, you talk with people, uh, they just say that the tradition, the folklore is that, or someone knows about these ancient traditions, and it's a good hint of why this is happening, why this is taking place, or simply it's just seen as a tradition because that type of tree uh, is actually very um, fit. It's very suitable for the scope because is the roots of the cypress go very, very deep. So clearly they don't interfere with the corpse, with the, the, with the tombs. They create shade so there isn't uh, too much of heat in the burial ground because you have to take in mind that heat means decomposition. Uh, which means not only bad odor, but clearly uh, sicknesses, diseases. So there's a, there are many reasons which may fall in the narrative, okay, the folklore. While instead, if we take a look at the historical record, and this time we have an historical record, not an archaeological record, it is very clear why this tradition is still carried on today, actually, because there is an edict of 18 04, so called the Edict of Saint Claude, which was created by Napoleon. Napoleone Bonaparte. Yes, he decided that by law, all graveyards needed that type of tree around it. And that is why we have cypress trees around most cemeteries in Italy, and not only Italy. So this could be a good example to see how different things. Uh, fall in place, or they may be misinterpreted. It's it's a good a good idea, a good uh, example to to define the, a, a, a part of the processes that may be undergoing a belief. Let's proceed. Point number four: there is also a dangerous use of folklore, and one of the most sad and uh, despicable examples is furnished, even though it's a little bit of a stretch, but you're probably understanding what I'm, I'm trying to say to express is, for example, the Nazism ideology or the Soviet ideology, where they uh, gather some beliefs, some traditions, and they mix them with some historical facts bypassing a few, re remixing everything, remastering and creating a new version of something in order to nobilitate, in order to uh, somehow support their other ideas, their ideology in general. So that is a big downside, a big risk, a big danger that unfortunately the use of folklore tied to archaeology and history in general does happen. And we always have to make sure that we are taking this into consideration. Even when we're just reading scholarly publishings, uh, literature of that time dedicated to archaeology, which appears maybe just as a normal research, there may be some propaganda in there, okay? Let's proceed. Our last point clearly is dedicated to the positive use of this, of folklore. It is something, as I said even before, that it is worth taking into consideration, especially when we don't have that many sources on which to rely on. So if you have that, no problem. Take it into consideration, but you have to do a thorough assessment of what is happening. Uh, it may somehow help us in our research, but it cannot guide it, okay? This is paramount. I want to underline it. Okay, so since the question from Eric also reasonably uh, asked for some examples, there aren't that many, actually. At least it's difficult to find them, and I am not dealing with folklore usually. So I found a very interesting publication. Actually, actually is a PhD thesis by Tina Pafitis, who is now an associate professor at Bergen University, and she's proceeding in this field, actually. And she mentions two examples, very interesting, I think, but clearly connected to recent history. One is the Nor Norwegian cairn fields, 
where uh, archaeologists thought it was just the clearing of fields, meaning piling up stones, or maybe Iron Age tombs. Very distant, but that was the, the, the hypothesis. While instead, local people knew that those were the result of the pre-Black Plague cereal fields. So, and, and this was later confirmed by archaeological investigations. So already there, we start to understand how folklore, meaning the tradition, the oral tradition of people in a specific community can be very helpful. Another interesting example is the presence of uh, flint tools, prehistoric flint tools in medieval context. Uh, Dr. Pafitis was uh, reporting this, where uh, in the beginning researchers didn't understand why they, why they were finding all these flint tools hidden in, in houses and structures and places belonging to the medieval times. Well, the, 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 the tradition, the folklore, revealed perfectly what was the use actually. It, because people were finding these, they thought they were the result of lightning bolts. So they would put them hidden in the, in the different structures in order to protect that structure from a thunderbolt. There is this type of, uh, of um, we, it's, it's almost a magic practice to uh, somehow keep away something with the result of that issue, of that problem. So very, very interesting uh, situations where folklore did help researchers. In any case, I want to underline once more that this is something very interesting and a lot of times actually archaeologists or historians overlook or simply put aside because not reliable. It is a good starting point, but we must take them into, into consideration. Absolutely, I'm, I do believe in this. Okay, guys, please send your question to ask at damnest.org. We are interested in all your ideas and visions and questions about uh, antiquity. And what else can I say? Understanding the past explains the present and defines our future. Thank you for watching. Bye. Hi, guys. If you want to discover more about archaeology and our ancient past from a different perspective, make sure to click on the Camnus logo here below. And don't forget to turn on the notification bell so you will never miss an episode and join the archaeological community in search of the truth.